It's a very great honor. I, I'm, I'm delighted to have received this prize. It's, uh, you know, it, it's something that makes me aware of a, of a sort of larger world of literature than I had been before, and, and uh, to be part of it is, is a great honor. I only became acquainted with her work as a result of, of being notified that I had received this prize. Um, I was very engaged by the, the writing of, that I was able to read, that I had time to read. Um, the characters that she draws are very beautiful, and this, this, she evokes a very beautiful world with you know, such detail and so movingly. Um, I, I certainly will go right back and read more of her. <laughs> yes, certainly, absolutely. I've done that already, actually. I, t I, was, I, I talked to my students in workshop one day about having looked at, at her work and, and what they could take from it, you know. Um, the, the, the question of Christian humanism is very important for me. I, I, I'm a Renaissance scholar by training, and I read Renaissance, you know, Reformation theology. And one of the things that is very important to me is the insistence on simply the absolute value of any human being as such. You know, the brilliance, the, the poignancy, the, you know, amazing capacities that human beings have. I really feel as though in order to restore the integrity of religious faith in this period, we actually have to relearn reverence toward human beings. And uh, so exploring that idea is very, very important in everything that I write. Oh, well, uh, you know, I think that I, to, I don't really want to tell things to readers, you know. I want to explore something that feels true in my mind. And one of the things is that, uh, that lives that one might not consider eventful or rich can in fact be profoundly rich. And, and dramatic, uh, even it, though the drama is not expressed in any form that's visible to another person. Um, and since, since John Ames is a pastor, he articulates thoughts and feelings and so on in a way that someone else might not. But the basic interest for me is in the fact that, that people feel deeply and experience richly and, uh, you know, I would like to say there was improvement. I'm afraid not. But um, my, I think of it this way. There is the reality that I cherish and I wish to see protected, and that's the humanist side of my fiction. And my nonfiction is a sort of, as I see it, a sort of defensive strategy for trying to protect what is, what is most precious, you know, the, the other thing that I dream of or imagine when I'm writing fiction. I don't really know. I, I, I did an ordinary academic PhD and so on. You know about these things. And um, it made me very interested in you know history and research and all that. Um, I, I never stopped being interested in writing fiction, but I also never stopped being interested in doing you know, research and, and historiography and so on. Um, I'm, I just go from one to the other. It makes me feel good to go, to, to, it refreshes me to go from one to the other. Uh, I, I, I like them both, you know. Impressions. Oh, many impressions. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly, um, the, the overriding impression is of an enormous kindness and thoughtfulness and graciousness. It, it really has been wonderful. Um, and then, of course, you know, so much of terrain is beautiful, the mountains are are wonderful and and it's interesting to see another modern society developing on other principles and aesthetics and so on. Um, it, it, it complicates the idea of the modern in a way that nothing else has ever done for me. You know, when you look at France or something, it's more as if they're avoiding modernity. <laughs> and, you know, which Korea certainly is not doing, you know, so it's very interesting. Well, I mean, the, the objects are simply beautiful in their own right, you know. Um, also, it's just so, uh, it seems as if the idea of printing very quickly turned into a way to develop ornamentation across a whole field of life 
and, and, you know, which is very brilliant. And I don't think we have anything quite like that in historical printing in, you know, in medieval Europe. The, uh, the, it's just touching to me that people from such an early point wanted to make anything beautiful that they could find a way to make beautiful, you know. Um, the, the patience and skill and so on that these artifacts are full of is just very moving. Well, um, we try very hard, I mean, we all do, to, to help the student develop an in, the individual vision that moves them toward writing in the first place. Uh, we think of writing as uh, not a skill, but something deeper than that, a testimony, you know. Um, and uh, one of the problems, it's an art school, basically, you know. So on the one hand, we choose people that we take to have special gifts. On the other hand, we see our primary uh, obligation to them as being uh, developing their gifts along the lines that are natural to them. So the, every class, every meeting of the class has to be very carefully gauged so that, you know, the writer learns something valuable, is more able to write well after the class than before it, you know. <laughs> I had an impulse to write before I had any conception that there was such a thing as a professional writer. I, I was just, you know, on my own as far as that sort of thing is concerned. I wrote poetry when I was a child. I read all the time. Um, I knew that, you know, some books were by Dickens, but I had no idea about <laughs> Dickens, you know, and so on. Um, so I actually was writing a, a good while before I had any idea of writing. And then um, when I wrote Housekeeping, um, I wrote it thinking it was unpublishable. I had sort of fun trying to write an unpublishable novel. And uh, then a friend of mine sent it to an agent without telling me he was going to do that. And I got a letter from the agent saying she would be happy to represent it. And so suddenly I was a professional writer. Without <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess so. <laughs> That's good friend. <laughs> yes, an excellent friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I actually sort of prepared to be a, a professor, but I, I mean, I wrote a dissertation and all that, but I didn't really want to. I was really hiding out in graduate school because I could just read books and, <laughs> and have interesting friends, you know. Um, but then when I um, graduated, when I got my degree, I um, realized that I had been actually beginning a novel because I was writing descriptive paragraphs, you know. Um, I taught for a while as an adjunct of various kinds and uh, at the same time was finishing the novel. And uh, then my friend sent it to his agent and my life changed dramatically. <laughs> Being a good writer, it's highly individual in every case. Right. right, right. <laughs> um, I tell my students to respect their interests. If they find themselves interested in, you know, space, or they find themselves interested in bacteria, or they find, you know, anything, um, that has been more or less what I have done in my life, just give myself over to one thing after another. But, but you have to have a broader base than simply literature itself in order to have the confidence that you need to write well. So, um, I'm, you know, any writer, I think, says if you want to be a writer, read. And I say that too, but read widely. And, and if you have an appetite for some particular field, you know, do it. You know, be good at it. That's very important. Um, well, um, I was just reading. <laughs> You know, I read, I, I was aware of certain reputations, you know, and I was a little snobby. I read uh, old, old books of a sort of Victorian type, you know. Um, I read a lot of Dickens. Um, I read, I read Rudyard Kipling only because my grandfather had his complete works in his house. Kipling? Yeah, Rudyard, can't bear him. <laughs> Um, but I, I read a lot of poetry. My brother would give me books of poetry and so on. Um, 
I had no thought about be becoming a writer, but the thing that was important to me was that people would tell me that I wrote well. From my point of view, I was simply doing what the circumstance required. Um, also, oddly enough, I, I grew up in a, in a sort of a very old-fashioned school system, so I had a lot of Latin. And one of the things that we did in, in the classes is make like rhymed translations from Virgil, you know? <laughs> they had no idea of the difficulty of what they were asking, you know? <laughs> but <laughs> having to do it was a wonderful training. Yes. Well, um, I think that her, um, you know, work is, is certainly influenced by the great classic novelists, the great Europeans, and, and uh, she um, has a, uh, uh, again, you know, the, her reverence basically for the people in the life that she describes, you know, uh, whether they're good or bad or doing well or doing poorly or whatever, uh, she's there like some sort of attending spirit that is, is appreciating the, the details of their lives, you know, things, knowing things about them they don't know about themselves, you know. Um, and the way that she, uh, I, I was very moved by the beginning of the first book, which is a description of night coming basically over over a sort of rural compound, and and uh, it's almost like she tucks people in, you know. It's like, you know, and the, and the great silence, the great silence of the night, and and then I was so struck by the beautiful image of the moon as a widow dressed in white, and the idea of the you know, the silence of the moon and the distance and the sort of self-absorption, you know, that is beautifully described by that suggestion. And also the fact that as distant as the moon is and, you know, it, it mirrors human life. It, it has a human circumstance. And it, it, it just makes a beautifully whole world out of everything she's, she's describing. <laughs>